<clears throat> I will tell you that if you want to get interactive and you feel like getting your energy up, feel free to come a little bit closer or feel free to be very, very loud coming up. All right. My name is Joyce Lin. I'm the head of developer relations for Postman. It's a developer conference. How many people have heard of Postman? Yeah. Excellent. Good work. Passing so far. Um, and actually, we have more than 25 million developers now. So since the time that I submitted my bio, we are used by over 25 million developers. So let me start with my first question to you. We are in Miami. How do you pronounce this word? So glad there are some Spanish speakers here. <clears throat> so some people have never heard of alternate pronunciations to API. I'm not prepared to say API for the rest of this talk, so we're going to go with API. But Spanish speakers, French speakers, a lot of people do say API. OK, so the title of this talk, APIs are eating the universe. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, it's such a ubiquitous concept for developers. All of us work with APIs, if not consume them in our everyday lives. So I just touch my butt. That's my phone there, wearables. Everyone uses APIs. And 12 years ago, in an essay published in the Wall Street Journal, Mark Andreessen, co-founder and general partner of Andreessen Horowitz, said software is eating the world. And this is in 2011. This is a decade after the dot-com bubble. Apple had just become the biggest company in the world, replacing ExxonMobil. Netflix was a whippersnapper, just started streaming movies and TV to your home. Skype was the fastest growing telecom company um, and acquired by Microsoft for billions. So this is the climate at the time that Andreessen said this. And this is what he meant then and what we now know to be true. No matter what kind of company you are, if you weren't also a software company, you were dead in the water. You will not be able to compete. And this is 2011. Okay, software is eating the world. A few years later in Forbes magazine, software is eating the world, but services are eating software. So SaaS, software as a service, was a big player in town. That same year, also in Forbes, yeah, software ate the world. Now AI is eating software. Okay, so there's been a few times in the past few years where, yeah, AI looks like it's really something big's going to happen. I think now is one of those times, too. And then there was another shift. Software is eating the software that's eating the world. And that's true, too, right? So we had traditional industries that then got usurped and disrupted by startups that were building software on top of traditional industries. So it's another layer of abstraction. So 2011, Andreessen said, software is eating the world. It's true. Software did disrupt our economy, our entire way of life. And the pace of innovation and adoption is getting steeper and steeper as you move along that time horizon. Now we see technologies like ChatGPT reaching 1 million users in five days. That's still very chilling to me to hear that stat. The pace of innovation and adoption is just getting faster and faster. So the title of this talk is APIs are eating the universe. We'll start with a brief history of web APIs, including protocols and patterns. And if you feel confident, again, come a little bit closer. Um, we'll talk about the current state of the API report from Postman, six key findings, the future of web APIs, in my humble opinion, and then best practices and takeaways for working with APIs. All right, let's start with the brief history of web APIs. Okay. Pop quiz, hot shots. The year is 1993. Uh, I don't, I'm not so good at math, but some of us probably weren't born then. But what's the biggest thing to happen in 1993 to impact web APIs? Doom. <laughs> I heard Doom. <laughs> web browser, Netscape, very dub, dub, dub. You guys aren't litigious here in Florida, right? OK. So the World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee invented the first web client this beautiful, beautiful thing. There were webmasters responsible for maintaining web pages where you could download information and consume it. This is web 1.0. You also have SOAP. SOAP was a protocol of choice for service-oriented architectures. And then 2000, Roy Fielding developed a standard called REST, so any server could talk to any other server in the world. I heard this the other day. I don't know if it's true, but Roy Fielding was like Jesus. He said what the principles were and let everyone else interpret what REST meant. You have JSON. 
a data format for lightweight text between servers and browsers. Protobuf, Protobuf was around here, faster way to send binary data. And at this time, a common pattern for APIs was request and response. So the client sends a request, the server sends a response. Clients could request data when they need it or pull the server every once in a while to get new data. You know what I'm going to say next? Gosh, this guy's smart. Very close. So we had server sent events. OK, yes, push. Clients establish a connection to the server, and then the server pushes events to the client. And you can receive pings, errors, any kind of real-time unidirectional updates. And then it keeps going. We have webhooks now. You can get real-time data triggered by an event. Web sockets, another real-time communication mechanism, this time for two-way. Establish a connection, and you have bi-directional or two-way communication between client and server. So now you have server send events, webhooks, web sockets, a lot of choices for event-driven or asynchronous communication. And then on the API design front, Swagger, which later rebranded to Open API, was how you could describe the structure of your APIs so that machines and humans could read. This is also the same time frame, and Dreesen said, software is eating the world. In the following year, someone would ask a question on Stack Overflow. Keep in mind the year. How do you manually send HTTP post requests from Firefox or Chrome? What were the top answers at that time? Ajax? Curl? A REST API client? Yeah, what might that be? Who said that? Chrome extension? Yes, it's over there. If you were the actual person to say it, please do. So sorry if I hit somebody just now. Yes. So this was on Stack Overflow, the year is 2012. And at the time, our CEO, Abhinav, answered this. Postman was just a side project, but it got a lot of upvotes. And a year after this answer was posted, Postman became an actual company. OK, now back to API standards, we also have RAML, RESTful API modeling language to model APIs. And you also have API Blueprint to generate documentation for APIs. Both are considered API description formats like Swagger or OpenAPI. And then by 2015, remote procedure calls as a design pattern had been around for a while, protocol buffers too. But this is when Google introduces Google's remote procedure call, gRPC which mainly uses HTTP2, supports one-way, two-way, and streaming communication. And gRPC is seven to 10 times faster than REST. Another heavy hitter in 2015, GraphQL, introduced by Facebook Meta as a query language to avoid over or under fetching data. And then back to API standards, now you have things like async API, which is like open API, but for event-driven APIs. So instead of the HTTP1 request and response, uh, pattern of APIs, you have async API that's protocol agnostic. And at a high level, this is totally not all inclusive, but a good um, overall picture to get a visceral like sense of the timing and the cadence, there's lots and lots of choices for web APIs. You have architectural patterns, protocol standards. And at the same time, what was happening with APIs in the broader economy? OK, another pop quiz. OK, let's get some socks this time. It's 2000. What company launched the first modern web API? If you're in the top three, I'll give you socks. Who launched the first modern web API? Not you. You're forbidden from <laughs> What? Microsoft, excellent guess, no. Amazon is in the top three, so keep your hand up. I love how there is no reaction from anybody wanting to catch that. <laughs> Who's the? Top one or top two? Google, good guess, but no. Huh? Netflix, no. Facebook, no. Twitter, no. Yahoo, no. Oh, good guesses. See? Salesforce. You get three pairs of socks, give them to your friends. Salesforce. Excellent. Yes, so Salesforce had the first modern web API. XML, did you know that? 
Yeah, okay, yes, yes, yes. We had people that actually knew it, but excellent guesses, all of them. But Salesforce launched with a 400-page PDF docs. That's how you could figure out how to use their API. eBay was number two. They had a REST API with online docs, mm, a little bit better. And Amazon.com was the third. So this was the first time people realized you can actually make money with an API. You can provide value with an API. And then a few years later, Flickr let us store photos online, quickly followed by an API. And tech-savvy uh, users that knew how to use APIs were able to embed their own social photos on their social media feeds, in their own personal blogs. And social, quote unquote, social became a thing. So yes, a few years early for some of you, but Facebook and Twitter were born around this time. And they didn't have an API at the launch, but developers were scraping their websites and creating their own rogue APIs until a short while later, they caved and they launched their own APIs. Okay, but we saw two different approaches at that time. I'm not going to say what's happening now, but Facebook viewed third-party developers as untapped potential. The next year, they launched Facebook Platform, encouraging developers like us to build their own apps using Facebook's data. On the other hand, Twitter went the opposite way. People were like, oh my gosh, Twitter's so popular. People are using our API. Let's try to get some money from that. And they started removing functionality and putting rate limits on their API, and they lost a lot of developer trust. People had already built businesses and applications using their API, and a lot of developer trust just went away overnight. And then slowly but surely, you know, Jack Dorsey, the CEO at the time, even apologized and said, oh, that was a mistake. They started rebuilding that trust, building a lot of new features and functionality and working with the developer community until earlier this year, Elon Musk just threw it all away and said, hey, we're going to you know, not have a free API anymore. So it's kind of like a roller coaster ride. But the Twitter story, I think, is an important one because it shows us that APIs can make or break your developer community. This is how you treat your developer community. OK, oh my gosh, it's only 20, 2007. So now cloud, quote unquote, cloud is becoming a thing. Amazon launches storage and compute to provide cloud access to Amazon's data storage and server infrastructure. And up until now, APIs were always a layer on top of a bigger system, right? But now another quiz, who is credited as the first company to launch as an API? API is a product. Good guess. It is a, an API is a prod. Oh my god, that was a terrible throw. <laughs> uh, good guess, no. Just shout it out. I can't see you anyways. Twilio. Twilio, yes. Two for whoever's there. OK, so Twilio offered the first telephony in the cloud available by API. They took a traditional industry, offered that to developers as an API. API is a product to become multi-billion dollars in market cap. And now you have companies like Stripe and Infobip and Algolia that are doing the exact same thing. This is another abstraction on top of it, a way to find value. That same year, Apple launched the first app store one year after they introduced the iPhone. Now mobile, quote unquote, mobile is becoming a thing. And very soon, every company is going to think that they need a mobile app. Foursquare, anybody remember Foursquare? This is, you can check into your local ice cream shops, right? Become mayor of that ice cream shop. Local is becoming a thing now. And then you have companies like Yelp and Groupon shortly thereafter. All this was happening before Andreessen finally said, software is eating the world. OK, a little legal stuff going on. GDPR, uh, APIs can support, be used for good to support the privacy and security of personal data in Europe. We, I don't know that we have such rigor here. Um, Cambridge Analytica, this just got settled for many hundreds of millions of dollars, like I think earlier this month. Um, APIs can be used for evil to harvest data and influence US presidential elections. And speaking of legal action, Oracle versus Google. Oracle sued Google, saying Java API, you use Java programming language API, you can't do that, uh-uh, Google. And the US Supreme Court decided APIs cannot be copyrighted. That was a programming language API, but this applies to web APIs too. There's a difference in the implementation code and the declaring code. And this is great news for any developer, anybody that has APIs. This means that you can remix APIs. And this is why if anybody's worked with cloud storage, you see Amazon-specific headers, S3 compatible APIs, no matter if you're running on Amazon servers or not. This allows you not to have to recreate the wheel every time. Good news for us. 
So another stroll down memory lane, modern web APIs have grown, and we've seen public APIs, developer platforms, cloud, making money with an API, providing value with an API, web 2.0, and social, local, mobile. Is anybody old enough to know? Yeah, shout it out if you know it. Very good context clues, whoever that was. Social, local, mobile. That was like the buzzword at the time, solo mo. Kind of dumb, kind of cringe, but that was a thing. So excellent reminiscing with you, but now it's 2023. So let's take a look at the current state of the API. Postman, the company I work at, surveyed 37,000 respondents and distilled this down to six key findings, which I am about to tell you so that you don't have to read the report. Insight number one. 51% of respondents say that more than half of their organization's development effort is spent on APIs. We're looking at the bar orange bars from 51 and beyond. More than half of your time is spent on APIs. And that number has been growing year over year for the last several years. That trend continues. Insight number two, you are all optimistic on API investments. There's a reason why an API talk is on the agenda today. So if you add up the orange on the right side and the blue on the top sections, 89% of respondents say that they will increase or hold steady API investments over the next 12 months. And that's even though the majority of you have a pessimistic view on the economy, and even when you filter on C-level, CEO, CTO, CIOs, they say we're holding API investments the same or increasing them next 12 months. Insight number three. API-first leaders outperform in every area. We're looking at the aggregate blue, dark blue, light blue bars, people who agree. Three out of four respondents agree that developers at API-first companies are more productive, integrate with partners faster, are happier. So API-first, what does that mean? There's a lot of definitions. There's not a consensus. You can see that some people who work with APIs aren't even sure what that means. Um, but the most common definition is gonna be that top one. Defining and designing APIs and schema, that's the key word, before beginning development. So especially among API first leaders, what they mean is schema-driven development, like open API or Swagger. So according to this definition, how many people are API first? Do you use a schema to develop your, design and develop your APIs? Okay. I saw like a handful of hands, and that's about correct. Um, it's about 8% of the total market that fall in that top category right there. Insight number four. I'm not sure why this is in the API, state of the API, but most of the world views remote work as very important, and yet a lot of us have return to office policies, right? So how many people here work 100% remote? Oh, so jealous. Hybrid, anybody have to go into the office a few times? I'm in this bucket. Okay. Anybody full-time in the office? Okay, make eye contact. Are you looking for a new job? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I, I see some nods. Okay. So remote work is very important, and yet we have a little smattering across the board. Insight number five. What are the most important factors when consuming and producing APIs? Number one factor is how well it integrates with internal apps and systems. This is new in the top three this year, which is Kind of surprising, but maybe not. Businesses are using more APIs to share data and offer services internally. And in fact, if you scroll a little further down, you can see um, proliferation of microservices is one of the um, factors. So what is important when producing an API? Same. Same for producing, same for consuming. Internal integration is the most important thing when producing and consuming APIs. And this has implications for the entire lifecycle especially API design and documentation. Oof, last one, flying through these. Insight number six, what are the biggest obstacles producing APIs? Lack of time, lack of people. And that third biggest obstacle is new this year, lack of API design skills. Sorry, this is where that microservices is coming into play. I don't care what my company already has, I'm just gonna spin up a new service, consume, <laughs> consume what I make. So six key findings. Developers are spending most of their time on APIs, most, most, and this trend is growing year over year. Most pl plan to spend the same, plan to invest the same or more developing APIs, okay, that's good. Uh, API first leaders outperform, they're happier. 
among other factors. Remote work is very important. Internal API integration is the most important thing when both consuming and producing APIs. In the last one, lack of API design skills is new, a new top problem when producing APIs. So we talked about a brief history of web APIs, the current state of the API. What's next? So this is going to be very personal to people. I'm not a future, what's it called, futurist. Take a moment and think in your head, what do you think is going to be the biggest thing um, to happen with APIs? What factors are going to be the biggest drivers? What's happening in the next 12 months for your team? And then you'll listen to what I have to say, even if you don't agree with it. So this is what's on my mind personally. Don't come at me. Web3, OK? I think Web3 is going to be a growing area, and APIs are still going to be an important part of that. It's decentralized web, right? So interoperability, getting real-time data, as important. Low code. So we talked about low code abstractions, that software on top of software, like Airtable, Shopify, Zapier. But now you have drag and drop app builders, right? Um, so how many, oh, OK, here we go. I'm getting rid of my stuff. How many professional developers are in the world right now? And we'll play Price is Right, Price is right rules. 100 million. 100 million. 20 million, 8, 30, 7, 80, 50, 1, 300, 1 dollar. <laughs> so the correct answer, 25 million dollars. Take it and share. It's 27 million, okay, professional developers at this point in time. In Postman, we've publicly said our mission is to create and empower 100 million builders. Well, wait, Joyce, there's only 27 million developers, right? So I think it's going to be a very different world. More than just developers are using APIs today, and that number is only going to grow, especially with these low-code tools. And so for API producers, like Postman has an API, you probably have APIs. This means your total addressable market will grow. But your target consumer is going to change, and that's going to mean different things about developer experience. <clears throat> yeah, you probably all have this on your personal list, OK? AI has really captured the world's imagination. How many people here have used Copilot? Oh, for those of you that have your hands down, please try it. It's so luxurious. Um, you know, I was a little bit skeptical. Like, I don't like new things. I'm afraid of change. Um, but I, I really do think that we're nearing an inflection point. And again, this has happened several times in the p recent years. But I really do think um, that chat GPT reaching 1 million users in five days, right? And now we have large language models like GPT, Llama, Lambda, um, connecting complex actions, right? And if you don't have an API, you are invisible to those LLMs. OK? Because they have to interact with something. They're not calling up somebody at your company. They have to interact with something. So I picked three trends, but each of these could be its own massive talk. That's what was on my mind. SmartBear just published their own state of the software quality report a few weeks ago and asked, what are the leading technology drivers for API growth? So there's still some time to gut check. What do you think is going to lead API growth? So we have microservices, AI, of course, IoT, cloud, mobile, blockchain. How does this compare to your own predictions? And is there a big gaping hole that we have not talked about or addressed? Please do come find me after this talk and tell me what's missing if you can make a case for something that's not on this list. OK. So we talked about the past, the present, the future of web APIs, according to my humble opinion. Next, let's talk about recommendations and best practices. APIs are eating the universe, so what can you do? Well, in the state of the API, we saw that internal API integration is the most important thing for both consumers and producers. What matters most when integrating with an API? What do you think is on that top 12 list? Oh, I have these little shorty socks I didn't see here. I saw her docs over here. You have to make a friend and give it to docs. Observability. Is that observability? Usability, I heard. Scale. OK, you're so good with participation. 
I don't know the air handling is on there, but it's so important. Security. I'm sorry, did you say security? <laughs> okay. Okay, so intuitively, we kind of know what's most important, but when we look at the data, yes. So somebody said scale, performance. Uh, the API has to do what it needs to do quickly, securely, reliably. Okay, we'll come back to performance. That's an important one. But other factors that rated very high year over year, documentation is at 64% over there. Usability over here was at 51%. And these have to do with developer experience. And there's a couple talks on the docket today about documentation and developer experience. One measure of that is time to first call. How much time does it take your user to make their first successful call? So think about it, whether or not you have a public API or internal APIs, what do they need to consume your API? Do you have to create a project, get credentials, get access, get a role, get a group, generate new access tokens? What do they need to do and how long does it take? Is it five minutes, five hours, five days? And if you think that's ridiculous, I work at Postman, so I ran my own experiment with some API providers. These are public APIs here, okay? So what are we looking at here? API providers across the bottom. Let's take that first one. Ignore that huge red line for a second, OK? This API provider, I think most of us have worked with many of these APIs. It takes 17 minutes to get to 200 if they just read the docs and do their own thing. It takes 10 minutes if they fork a Postman collection. OK, so this is, I, this is the process that I ran. Now look at that huge red bar. Do the math. Can somebody do the math? How long is that? What? <laughs> oh, I thought I heard 55 days. That's days for sure. Let's not be precise with the math. We're developers here. OK, so like, this is a huge, huge difference. Why is that? OK, so maybe some of you don't know Postman that well, but a Postman collection um, is going to have a huge impact because of two reasons. One, you formatted the API in a way that's really quickly executable. All the pieces and parts, headers, parameters, all that, boop, done. And you're presenting it in a way that's familiar to developers. You're not teaching them a new tool. You're not taking them to a new area. So that's two reasons why the delta between the blue and the red bar is so huge. But if you don't know that developers are looking for this, how do you even know? So how can you gain insight into what you should prioritize? OK, so in these examples, one big thing was we looked at zero search results. If you have access to search results on your developer portal, see what people are searching for where they have no results. Uh, ask your developers. Quarterly survey to partners was another one. Vercel. Vercel does exposure hours where they watch other people's live streams and see how they interact with their tech. It's kind of creepy, but kind of cool, right? If every engineer did that and watched somebody use their tech, they'd have immediate aha moments. So what are they looking for? More than documentation, for sure. They're looking for a get started guide. They're loading, looking for code samples, SDKs. But until you know what your internal or external consumers are looking for, you don't know. And this directly impacts adoption and productivity for both internal and external. OK, F fantastic. Developers' experience is important, but who is responsible for it? Is this like quality and security? Everyone's responsible for it. Is it that team, that team called developer experience, or that person with developer experience in their title? So let's look at an analogy. OK, so this is the new M1 MacBook Pro by Apple. This is what this is right here. And for a lot of API producers, this is representative, again, analogy, of core functionality. I just set this up a few um, weeks ago. It was easy. I opened it up, stepped through a wizard. If I have a problem, I'm going to go to the Apple Genius Bar, submit a ticket. Whatever. So for a lot of API producers, an API is more like this thing here. And if you guys aren't hardware people, this is kind of new. This is called a framework laptop. It's completely configurable, repairable, um, customizable. And users get to choose precisely what they want on their laptop. Um, so when you open up a framework machine, first you can open up a framework machine. Not so sure about this guy here. Uh, but take a look. Every part is clearly labeled. There's a QR code that takes you directly to repair guides, discussion threads, um, and further documentation. So your core product is going to function a little bit more like a MacBook, and your API is going to be expected to be more like a framework, each with different capabilities and developer experience. And when we look across the API lifecycle, we know producers spend a ton of time on the develop 
stage. But you're impacting developer experience throughout the entire life cycle, defining and designing your API, thinking about how to model your data, error handling, incredibly important for developer experience, all the way through testing to securing to documentation, which is traditionally what people think of as DevX. But if you wait until the last stage, you've already, do you guys know this saying, putting lipstick on a pig? Is that not a thing here in Florida? OK. You already have the most inconsistent, unpredictable API, and so documentation is not going to fix all that. And for the consumer lifecycle, you might have a team that's dedicated to that, but a lot of us are doing more with less, so really find the places where you can make the huge, huge difference, like that time of first call. We've seen that there can be huge, huge impacts. Um, and then we were looking at the delta between the blue and the red, but just scan across the blue. It's not ridiculous. It's not ridiculous to say somebody is going to take 25 minutes on average um, to make their first successful call. But do you even know where your users are struggling? OK, I'm running out of time. And this part is really fantastic, because if there's one thing that everyone in this room heard me say earlier, um, it's about protocols, patterns, and standards. So I'll go through this really quickly. And if you want to hear it and talk about it more slowly, Come talk with me. Let's start with the king of APIs. What's the king of APIs? RESTful APIs, OK? HTTP one and done, request response. We talked about that earlier. And a lot of times, you're underfetching or overfetching. You have to get the whole cheeseburger. You can't just pluck out the tomato. And in an event-driven architecture, you have asynchronous patterns. You have callbacks, promises, and awaiting for the async API to return something before you continue through the rest of your code. And do you, remember, do you remember what matters most when building an integration? Performance. Is performance network latency? Is it total response time? Does your team actually care about total load on the server and not speed? So one of my most popular TikToks that I'm positive 20% of you heard was about how gRPC is 7 to 10 times faster than REST. It's faster. You can do synchronous, asynchronous, choose whether to be stateful. But for many teams, it's moot. Do not go the route of gRPC when REST is good enough. There's a lot more questions to consider. Oh, damn, that's a really good point, too. OK, let's just close. We're nearing the end of our time together, and we'll do this. We learned how to pronounce this word. We talked about the past, the present, and the future of web APIs, and a little bit about protocols, patterns, and architectures. And there's a lot of choices, which is fantastic, because APIs are growing a lot. And developers are spending more and more of their time working on APIs year over year. And teams are investing more and more resources in APIs and their strategy and their execution. So in 2011, when Andreessen said software is eating the world, he meant that no matter what kind of company you were, if you weren't also a software company, you will not be able to compete. Today, we're saying this. If you aren't also an API company, if you don't have an API strategy, if you don't consider an API first, when building out new features and functionality, you won't be able to compete against someone who does. And in the end, three takeaways. Happy to talk for minutes at a time on any one of these, um, but thank you very much. <laughs>